Obviously, what Knight has done with the News Hour and working with us and making possible our, uh, our arts coverage, we've given it a name, Canvas. It has enabled us to tell stories that really are, are the heart of, people think of news as straight news, and yes it is, but if we couldn't tell the kinds of art stories that we are able to do, we wouldn't be telling the whole picture of America. And frankly, it also enables us in so many ways to get away from the coast, to get to the middle of the country, the heart of the country, and again, to tell stories that are so important uh, in, our, in our role as journalists. So I just have to say the thank you tonight uh, as we begin uh, this conversation. Um, it is, thank you. It is, uh, the title is Making Issues Move, the Role of Data and Digital in, in Our Democracy. Uh, and um, you could not ask for two individuals who are better suited to talk about it than, uh, than Teddy Goff and Ori Renan. I think you have their bios. You know that uh, Ori is at the White House. Uh, heading up uh, digital strategy there. Teddy Goff, of course, ran digital for the Obama campaign, uh, has been very involved in, uh, in governance and, and in uh, digital on the political side. He now runs his own, runs his own firm. But I want to start this conversation with a kind of a personal question so that people know that where the two of you are coming from. First of all, where did you grow up? Uh, second of all, just to kind of place you generationally, May I ask how old you are? Uh, and third, uh, how did you get news and information when you were becoming an adult? Teddy, I'm going to start with you. Um, sure. Um, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, um, uh, and I've moved four miles in my life. Um, I'm 34 <laughs> years old, so I, you know I was in college when uh, I think I was one year behind Zuckerberg and um, and his uh, set. So I remember clearly when um, Facebook was coming along, and then uh, after it, Twitter and everything else. Um, I was an avid reader of the New York Times as a kid, and um, I still am. But obviously, the kind of form factor for the Times has changed. I'm a I'm, I'm a person who spends an embarrassing amount of time on Twitter, and I try to get, you know, credible news sources from it, but the discovery mechanism is, is Twitter these days. What about you, Ori? Uh, so I grew up in New York as well, in Queens. Uh, I went to college oh in gosh. Manhattan, okay. so You're we have a very New, York. uh, okay. New York-centric view here. Um, I, uh, I'm also in my early 30s, and I get a lot of news and got a lot of news growing up. Um, I think online early on, I was that geeky kid who loved computers and loved the internet. Um, I think... I'm less uh, social driven in how I get my news. I think that some of the really interesting things that have happened in the past couple of years are how news has been able to find uh, platforms other than their own websites. I'm a big fan of Apple News, for example. So, uh, so going beyond uh, what some people might think, you, you look at Twitter and, and that's it. Yeah, I think Twitter's a great place to hear um, a perspective on news from people you follow. It's not the best place to get the news on its own. So I want to add, and, and, and to both of you, Teddy, to both of you, do you think average Americans are better informed today than when you were growing up or not? Um, I think it's, um, uh, I, I mean, I think it depends how you define better informed, but I mean, my answer is no. They're worse informed. I think they receive more content. Um, there are more ways to receive a, a greater diversity of content, and some of that's you know that's a good development. Um, the last panel spoke about that very um, compellingly. I, I don't think that uh, um, older you know the days of the mainstream media that it's easy to be nostalgic about were um, perfect by any stretch, and they left a whole lot of marginalized voices out of the discussion, of course. Um, but they also um, you know made sure that everybody was you know reliant on essentially a single set of facts, or maybe two sets of facts, but not a hundred or, or a million sets of facts. And um, I think it's possible to look. It's impossible to look at the. Um, Dialogue today and conclude anything other than that it's you know utterly um, um, transformed um, you know and, and to its own detriment by misinformation and um, and confusion and that's a result of the media discovery ecosystem that we have today. How do you see it, Ori? I think people have the opportunity to be as informed as they ever have, and there's a responsibility as an American citizen to inform yourself as to. Um, what's really going on. And I think today's information environment provides more opportunity to find information, to find facts, to learn the truth than ever before. 
There's responsibility that comes with that. There's challenges that comes with that. It's a more complex information environment. The gatekeepers that have traditionally um, been at the forefront of that information environment are changing. One thing we see a lot is um, people talk a lot about followership and reach and all that. But when you think about engagement, who's actually driving reactions and engagement and interest online? Individuals drive far more engagement than brands. You look at this in media and you look at the engagement rates of a major publication versus some of its top journalists. Um, you look at it in politics, in government, in um, consumer brands. Individuals are driving that engagement. People want to hear um, from other people they know and they trust. And so that voicefulness becomes a key part of it. That presents challenges, but it also presents a lot more avenues through which people can be informed. So does that mean you think on balance that people are better informed because of the influence of individuals more than ever? I think people can be better informed. They have the opportunity. Yes. So scenario, whether you're the president of the United States or somebody running for the Senate or you run a nonprofit right now and they're uh, or, or you're, in, you're in office, or you, uh, you are in a position where there's an issue that really matters to you, whether it's the environment or you want to do something about tax cuts. What's the best way to get that message across right now, Ori? So I think, I think one thing to note that's important is digital has gotten a lot easier. It's not the secret sauce that you need a lot of expertise in anymore. The secret to digital is speak like a human being and be authentic. Create content people actually care about. Um, so for those of you who are in this room working at community foundations, um, a lot of these great organizations, it used to be that you needed to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a website, you needed a video production team or consultants that would charge you $30,000, $40,000 a video, um, designers, creators, all this stuff. It's gotten a lot easier iPhone videos are fine. Um, there are tools out there that let you design graphics like Canva that are easy to use and simple. Digital's made it a lot easier for um, all kinds of groups to get messages out. And it's unfortunate that sometimes people get in their own way. We get in our own way. If you're on Twitter and you're linking to a PDF report, are people really gonna open that on their phones? Um, if you're writing a press release that sounds like it was written for the board of your organization and with no other audience in mind, is it really going to break through? So digital is easier than it's ever been. The bar for authenticity is higher, but that's a good thing. But so you, you pretty much only touched on digital there. Does that mean that it's 100% digital or do you worry about the... Uh legacy media, old-fashioned media, other, I mean, how do you, so, how do you think about, about how that message is going to reach yeah. as many people as you need to reach? I've spent a lot of time thinking about that because one of the challenges coming in to um, a new administration, and I think every administration faces this, is where does digital fit? Digital in the White House has evolved going back to the Clinton years and the Bush years and the Obama years. Um, and I think where we are right now is Digital isn't this separate thing. It's part of everything. When you think about um, the New York Times article you just read, yeah, you could have read it in print, or maybe you heard the story on their podcast, or maybe you saw one of their reporters um, in a clip online. More likely, you saw an article on Twitter or you went on their website. Um, digital isn't a separate thing anymore. It's kind of a part of the entire information ecosystem. I'd say it's the overwhelming majority of the information ecosystem. So Teddy, um, does that sound like what you would do? I mean, if you, you know, whether you were working under, in the Obama administration, working on that campaign, or, or for the kind of work you do right now? Yeah, I, I agree with um, most of what was just said, and I, I certainly think that it's a, it, there's, uh, you know, d digital and the, the so-called legacy media, I don't know why people call it that, the traditional media are interwoven. It's not a coincidence that, you know, the New York Times subscription base is bigger than it's ever been during the rise of Twitter. You know, the two are, um, the two can complement each other and support each other's growth. I believe that, and I think, you know, when you think about a media strategy, you've got to think about, um, 
how to get a message out um, everywhere. I, I guess I do think, and I, I presume we'll you know, sort of get into this, it, you know, it's important not to be too utopian, though, about what it means to, you know, um, or how one finds an audience today, or what it means to deliver a message that's interesting to people. You know, a lot of messages aren't going to be that interesting to people, but they may still be important. Um, a lot of messages um, may have difficulty finding a passionate audience. They may resonate broadly but shallowly. Um, you know, and I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing um, um, polarization in our politics is that these platforms obviously create an incentive for those who are yelling and screaming or talking to some community of passionate concern. That can be, um, you know, that can feel great when it helps, uh, you know, produce or accelerate the Arab Spring or when, you know, uh, same-sex marriage, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, that movement moves so quickly because people are telling their stories and people are finding their um, community and everyone's retweeting each other. I mean, it doesn't feel so great when it has to do with, um, you know, when it has to do with hate, when it has to do with fear, when it has to do with grievance. And so, you know, I think, um, uh, I think a question that everybody in media and politics and tech is going to have to have to fight over and hopefully come to some, um, you know, non-dystopian resol resolution to is, you know, how, how do we continue to make sure that people can be well served by content, can find the content they care about, can be well served by politicians and media that are giving them the kind of things they care about um, without playing to the absolute worst instincts in, you know, in human nature. And that's a real challenge, I think, for people who are trying to get attention around a less sexy issue or something that's out of the news or, you know, something where you're urging moderation rather than extreme, you know, rather than something at the extremes. Or how do you do that? I mean, let's just let's talk about it. I mean, um, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of criticism out there right now. Well, I think. About, uh, go ahead and respond. Well, I think you said something really interesting. You talked about um, interesting versus important. If it's important, we need to demonstrate why it's interesting. And I think, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of the audience in this room. When you think about what your goals are, what your metrics of success are, if you're looking for the same level of engagement on a piece of content, on a piece of information that really kind of tugs at the heartstrings, that has that emotional pull, as you are on something, let's say, related to um, tax policy, which I love, but people get less excited about, you're not gonna get the same engagement. That's okay. But if it's important and not instinctively interesting, how are you demonstrating why it's important? How are you demonstrating the relevance to the audience you're trying to reach? Um, at the White House, we make a lot of videos that explain policy. Um, we make videos that really kind of dive into why are we doing this, why does it matter, and we make some funny videos. We know that the funny videos are gonna do way better, but our metric of success is different. If we make an animated explainer video on a piece of policy and it does a million views, that's great. If we try to be really funny, we did this thing with, um, there was a video clip where some people heard Yanny and some people heard, heard Laurel, it was this weird internet thing. We made a video on that. That did like 30 million views. Different measures of success, and that's okay. I'm as happy and as proud with the, the million views on the policy issue because it got through. We were able to talk about why it matters, why we're doing what we're doing to an audience that's engaged. Can, and, and, and is there a limit to that? I mean, is there a point where you say enter, the entertainment piece of this, the humor piece of this, is taking people's attention away from the point we're trying to make? I don't think so. I think, I mean, there have been um, numerous examples of people in elected office being funny and being serious. Um, I think President Obama was great at bringing pop culture into the White House. It's a way to get people engaged. Once people are engaged, there are more opportunities to talk about policy. Eddie, what about that? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I guess to me to, to, to think about a funny video is almost the wrong example. You know, there's nothing wrong with a funny video. Funny videos are going to get views. Um, I have no problem with politicians or media outlets or anybody else putting out funny videos. I guess to me the bigger concern is let's think about some other examples of what can draw an audience. Um, you know, um, it's obvious that, um, you know, these are all kind of different examples, but the sort of freak show element of politics, you know, Speaker Pelosi ripping up a, a piece of paper is going to get more um, attention than an actual policy issue of concern to people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, it's obvious that um, hate and vitriol get a lot of attention. Um, it's obvious that, um, you know, whatever is in the Twitter, you know, news cycle of the day gets a lot of attention. So, you know, I think there's going to be, um, there's going to be nice examples where uh, you know, a, a, a serious policy explainer gets a decent amount of views and the goal wasn't virality and that's considered
considered a success. Um, there's going to be examples where a funny video gets a lot of views and that's innocuous. I think if you look at the ecosystem as a whole, the incentive structures are um, badly misaligned. And um, the whole system is built um, to um, monetize um, you know, people's reactions to um, things that are um, you know, sort of orthogonal to whether it's um, healthy to the discourse or, or productive to the actual policy outcome. Right, and that's and that's my question. And I think I think you said something really true there about incentives being misaligned, especially when we talk about media. So I come from a media um, and journalism and publishing background, and I think one of the things that is great about government is we don't monetize our content. So it's not like there's an incentive to get more views versus less views. We can focus on the topics we want to be talking about. When you're in publishing and you're monetizing through display ads or through um, content recommendation engines you are dependent on the amount of clicks you get for your lifeblood. If people aren't coming to your site and that's how you're monetizing, you're done. And so there's an incentive there to get people there regardless of the value or depth of the engagement that follows. I think the good news is a lot of people in media are starting to experiment with other avenues of monetization, with other um, incentive structures that provide different ways to look at it. So one of them um, is Quartz. Uh, it's a global business publication. It doesn't have any display ads. It's built around native content. And therefore, they're not in the business of chasing clicks for the purpose of monetizing display ads. Um, when they first launched, they sold sponsorships on share of voice. People, brands wanting to be a part of that particular content experience, be a part of that um, publishing ecosystem, and not having to worry about how many times did this display ad load. And by the way, it probably loaded on the bottom of the site where nobody saw it anyway. Um, so the incentives in that kind of legacy structure, again, legacy, I don't know if it's the right word, but they are misaligned. And for media, not just journalism, but media to do well, I think we need to have serious conversations about what engagements are of high value. Um, if somebody loaded a pre-roll ad and then watched the video for two seconds, was that worth it? How are we going to create mechanisms for people to be drawn in more deeply to long-form content? Sometimes people think the internet is snackable, short-form, um, punchy, pithy. There is room for long-form on the internet if you can demonstrate value. What's the incentive for, for anybody engaging in the internet, the, uh, Teddy and, and then Ori, to, uh, to, to think about the health of our democracy, which is what we're here? to talk about, to think about um, where we're going as a country, to think about our values uh, as Americans? Um, I think the short answer is they're not provided that incentive. You know, I mean, there's a narrow slice of people who care about that because they care about that, and they may seek out content or, you know, conversations that, that um, you know, that get to what you're, um, you know, get to what you're talking about. But I mean, I, you know, I think I, I've been thinking a lot, I'm sure we all have, um, about, you know, the kind of politics of optimization and what that means. And I, I used to be a lot more um, uh, rosy about it, not just because I used to win elections and now we've lost some elections, but I mean, I think there's, this has happened all over the world, you know. I've, I've, I've said this a lot of times, but it's no coincidence that, you know, President Trump is considered good at Facebook and so is President Duterte and so is the Brexit movement and so is the German far right and the French far right and President Erdogan and President Orban. On. Um, some of them may be prime ministers, sorry, I probably got that wrong, you know, but I mean, you know, th th these platforms serve to the advantage of these types of um, autocrats, and I don't think that President Trump necessarily belongs in league with all of those people. Um, uh, but with some of them, he does. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I think, you know, it's a short, you know, let's talk about a type of um, optimization that I think most of us would find innocuous. You log into Facebook, and, um, you know, if you have a friend who just got engaged to be married or just had a kid, that's probably going to be the first thing that comes up. And I think we all think, well, that makes sense. That's good news. That's much more interesting than most of the posts. Okay, I'm fine with that. I think it's a pretty short hop from there to, you know, let's serve ads um, to people uh, who, you know, may care about Facebook. But care about healthcare, let's serve them ads about healthcare. People who care about immigration, let's serve them ads about immigration. And it's a pretty short hop from there to, you know, let's um, find pockets of um, people who are, you know, racist, people who are intolerant, people who are driven by um, grievance or fear of the other, fear of immigrants, fear of women, whatever it may be, um, and serve them content that's going to um, um, stoke that and um, mobilize them further, help them find each other and radicalize them, each other even further. And so it's hard to really, you know, I think everyone thinks thinks, well, uh, engagement photo on Facebook, why shouldn't I be served that? That's nice. That's a better experience for me. But it's a very short line, I think, from there 
compared to some of the much more um, you know malign effects that we um, that we see, and it's the same kind of um, um, monetization mechanics, and obviously the same technical mechanics that drive both. Ori, clearly a lot of what uh, you know Teddy's describing is going on right now. How do you see that from where you sit at the White House? So I think you asked about the incentives online, and I think when you think about the ways in which people organize, when you think about the financial incentives of media, when you think about um, the kind of civic society nature of information and media, digital isn't that fundamentally different in kind from any other form of media. It's different in scale, it's different in scope. Um, and so before the era of, say, Facebook ads, as you were talking about, you could target a particular type of person by saying, I think they watch that kind of TV show. I'm going to buy ads on that kind of TV show. Now you can buy it by whatever particular interest area Facebook offers. Um, the CDC, for example, we're working them, with them really closely running ads um, around the opioid issue. We built a website called Crisis Next Door where people could share stories about how they've been impacted, and then we turned those into ads. The idea is to fight the stigma of opioid addiction and show how it's a crisis that touches every community. The targeting that we're able to do with those kinds of pieces of information is very valuable. It's not based on medical history or anything like that, but based on geographic areas where CDC is telling us there's a higher um, level of uh, concern with the opioid crisis, things like that. That's a good thing. That increases the efficiency of the delivery of the message. It reduces waste. Um, and so old media, new media, legacy media, digital media, it doesn't matter. It's all about how you use it. The tool itself, I don't think, is the evil part. And, 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 and so let's talk about, I mean, let's talk about the political motiv motivations here, the pol policy motivations, political motivations. They exist everywhere. And the motivations to stick to the facts, to stick to what's accurate. I mean, where are we? I mean, we are, we are now in an environment where misinformation, uh, disinformation is flying around. Um, what is our responsibility? What's your responsibility at the White House? Teddy, how do you see, Teddy, how do you see the responsibility of, of folks, whether they are in public office or whether they work in public policy? Um, and then, and after this, I want to ask you about the role of the social media companies. Well, I was going to um, get to that, so I hate to short circuit that, but I think it's impossible to answer the first question without getting to what it sounds like your follow-up is going to be. I mean, to me, it goes without saying that the um, press should um, report the truth, and there's always going to be debates about, you know, what's interpretation and what's truth. But, you know, I think reasonable people can agree most of the time on what truth is, and the press should report that. It goes without saying that politicians should speak the truth and not um, uh, originate or further disinformation. That's not the politics that we have right now, but it should be the politics, and I think it's hard to um, hard to dispute that. You know, to me, the problem, the pr and and I think um, you know, Ori said earlier, and I agree. Individual people have a responsibility. You know, we're 20 years into, um, or more, 30 years into the internet age, and 15 years into the Facebook age, and people can educate themselves and. Um, learn how not to um, further disinformation and things like that. But I, I do think that the primary responsibility here has to rest with the platforms. That doesn't, by the way, make me particularly optimistic that we're going to get a solution anytime soon. But there's study after study after study that shows that if a person has been exposed to something that's false, and then they're also exposed to a fact check or something that says this has been disputed or that was not true, they, the damage is done. They, they, ha they are highly likely to um, remember, recall, um, and believe the thing that they said. And, and in fact, they're likely to distrust the fact checker. Um, and that may actually just sort of make this, uh, this vicious spiral get worse. So you know, to me, um, the only possible solution um, is going to come when fewer people are exposed to less misinformation. Um, and there's no way to um, achieve that. I mean, again, we can all do our part. You know, Individual people can do their best to get educated and not share misinformation. Politicians don't have to do it. The press can, you know, figure out ways to do it less. Although I don't think they do it that much, um, you know. But fundamentally, to the extent that these campaigns are, um, whether it's domestic or foreign, you know, these are almost always campaigns. Um, they have a purpose. They have a political bent. They may be trying to make money as well. Um, <coughs> you know, um, those um, campaigns need not to be able to spread what the, you know, spread their content on the on Facebook and elsewhere, and um, have it achieve um, uh, you know massive reach in part by by uh, way of an algorithm that is designed to make a handful of shareholders money. And there's no solution I think that doesn't you know sort of originate there. What about that? I mean, the, the obligation, the responsibility to be accurate and to think about 
um, uh, what, what it is that's either misinforming or disinforming the American people. So I think in our role at the White House, the thing we can do best and what we try to do is to share as much of the detail as possible, to make the case, but to share the why, um, to delve into that information, and to frankly work across government, our sphere, um, to make information more accessible. So-and-so says the budget increases funding for this and that's really bad. So-and-so says it cuts funding and that's really good. Okay, how do we make it so that to find the answer, people don't have to wade through a 600-page PDF? How do we surface that information to make it more accessible? And you're right, some people are gonna get the information that isn't true, some people are gonna um, believe it without digging in. I think in government, what we can do best is give people as much information as possible. It's their tax dollars. Um, and in digital, what we need to be thinking through is how do we use the digital tools and resources that exist to make information more accessible than it's ever been before. Um, there are gonna be disagreements. We made a video explaining why pulling out of the Paris deal was a good idea. It talked through the lack of burden sharing, the lack of enforcement, um, the differentiation between levels of countries in terms of um, obligations. Um, and the French embassy in DC took the video, edited it, crossed out our words and put their own words into it. Okay, cool. They have a different perspective. They literally took our exact video file, manipulated it, not in a bad way. I think we need to be careful about how we use some of these words um, and some of the implications of them. And they made their case. And then people get to decide. And, and what is the role of, and we're, okay, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, the folks who are originating the material, but what is the role of our social media platforms? I mean, we've seen the decisions Facebook has made, Twitter, uh, YouTube. I mean, wh what, what is the role of these incredibly powerful social media platforms? I don't think there's an easy answer there. And I think the answers also depend on what kind of problems and what kind of content we're talking about. Um, these companies have started something called the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. And it's actually an incredible um, effort they've put together where they're able to take down almost all terrorist content, about 98% of it, within two hours of posting, automatically without a human ever seeing it. They're doing something called hashing, where if a video goes up on YouTube, an ISIS video goes up on YouTube, and YouTube takes it down, they'll add it to the hashing database, and when that video goes up on Facebook, doesn't matter if the file name's not exactly the same, doesn't matter if it's not um, the exact same length, Facebook will be able to take it down automatically because the digital signature of that video is in their database. That's the kind of content moderation I think we all agree we want these companies doing. It's the kind of content moderation these companies feel comfortable doing. Um, when we get into who gets to decide what's true and what's not, we get into much more complicated issues. Um, in the um, life space, for example, um, there was a piece of content that was taken down. It was of a medical doctor saying that a, um, a late-term abortion is never medically necessary. It was ruled to be disinformation. There was a medical doctor who disagreed, and there was a big debate about that. Should Facebook be in the business of deciding that? Should a medical doctor be able to express an opinion contrary to that of the fact checker? I think the toughest question here, I don't have the answer. The toughest question is who gets to decide what's true? Until we figure it out, my personal view is that government doesn't get to decide what's true and shouldn't get to decide what's true, and that these platforms, to your point about incentives and shareholders, I don't know that they're gonna get it exactly right. Um, so I think temporarily, you know, we're gonna continue to be talking through these questions, we're gonna continue working through these issues. Um, figuring out who is the arbiter of what's right and not, I don't know how we solve for that. But I think there's a lot of risk in getting it wrong. Um, you know, I, I think um, that um, if there are no rules and no police, um, then the advantage rests with the criminal and the advantage rests with the bad actor. And that's the case in the offline world and that's the case in the online world. Um, 
Um, so I agree um, that there's going to be um, lots of areas where reasonable people can disagree and where whatever this governing body that I'm postulating um, you know, is going to get it wrong and people are going to be very right to resent that their piece of content was taken down. Um, that's the case in the real world is we have hundreds of thousands of people in prison for you know, smoking marijuana and that shouldn't be illegal either. So I think the question is you know, how do we, instead of doing nothing, do something? You know, something would be better than nothing. And then as we do something, we could improve upon that something. Um, I agree it shouldn't rest solely with the company, and I agree it shouldn't rest solely with the government. Perhaps there's some way to have a, a coalition of government, the companies, and, you know, um, um, and third parties. But I guess the thing that I want to point out is they're already in the business of, of, um, of moderating content and of, of, you know, we use the word policing, policing what content you see. So I said earlier, you know, you, lo you log into Facebook and you see which friend of yours just had a baby. Um, they have decided that you are more interested in that than in your you know, other friends post about the sandwich you had for lunch. And by that same token, they have decided that nudity is not allowed on Facebook. Okay, seems reasonable. They've decided that photos of breastfeeding count as nudity, so you'll never see a photo of breastfeeding on Facebook. Not sure I agree with that one, but okay, I can see the logic there. So they have decided that they're not going to engage in questions over what does and doesn't constitute hate speech, except at the absolute extremes like terrorist speech or you know um, you know stuff that's sort of beyond um, you know be, beyond uh, dispute. Um, and so I guess what I think on that is neutrality is a choice. Neutrality is always a choice. And if they're in the business of deciding that um, breastfeeding is inappropriate, then it's not that they've decided not to get into the battle of hate speech. They have gotten into to the battle over hate speech, and they have um, put their thumb on the scale in favor of those who engage in hate speech. They are proactively supporting hate speech. Um, if they were a non-algorithmic platform, um, if they were a non-algorithmic platform, if it was the way that it once was on Twitter and Facebook, that you log in and you see um, a chronological feed of what everyone you follow has said, you know, I think there could be a, a much more reasonable case to make, but instead they are serving you the stuff that you think is most relevant, and that feels innocuous when it's a baby photo or an engagement photo. It's not innocuous when it's something that's, you know, that's hatred or, um, or misinformation or both. So, Ori, why don't the platforms have more of a responsibility, or maybe you think they do? And do you have conversations with, with the president about what he writes on Twitter and his... There are his two very different of, questions in there. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to um, be back. <laughs> about what he writes and, and the obligation he feels or doesn't feel to make sure that it's, that there's, that it's accurate. So I think... You know, you mentioned what it would be like if the platforms had a chronological feed with no recommendation engine, no algorithm. Um, from a purely digital perspective, from a user experience perspective, um, I personally love that, and I think those platforms wouldn't be what they are today and we wouldn't be having this conversation. With the sheer amount of content, what they've decided to do, you could say had to do, you could say all of us wanted them to do, was provide experiences that are more relevant, that are easier to sort through. Um, but that was a decision. And you know, I think for those of us who spend most of our days online, we wouldn't mind seeing everything in one place. There are ways to build those kinds of tools on Twitter, especially TweetDeck, things like that. Um, and so inherently, those decisions are going to be made if these platforms are going to scale. Um, I think my point isn't that there's no solution, it's that I don't know what the solution is, and that in every single situation you talk about, there's going to be that risk of getting it wrong, and we have to balance that risk versus kind of the reward. Um, you talked about the analogy of, um, of crime, and I think it's an interesting one. What a lot of people in criminal justice will say, you know, better than one, um, better than you know, X number of guilty people should go free than one innocent person um, should be in jail. The stakes aren't quite the same, but we- I think we disagree on who's innocent and who's guilty. Because <laughs> I would agree with that. I would just flip it as to who, who ought to be in- Okay, but then yeah. who gets to decide, right? I mean, if government, is it driven by politics? Is it driven by elections? What does that do to democracy? Um, it's a hard decision. I mean, I'll give you an example. You were talking about not quite terrorist content, but potentially harmful content. Uh, Senator McConnell posted a video of protesters outside his house making violent threats. Twitter took it down because it showed a violent threat. In most cases, when the victim or target of the threat um, puts up a piece of content saying, hey, this just happened to me, 
that wouldn't come down. Twitter made a decision in this case that it should. There were a lot of reasons behind it. They explain it. They talk about how um, it revealed personal information, including where he lives. OK. In other cases, they're comfortable revealing that information. Um, eventually, they put it back up. They said, we got it wrong. Fine, we'll work with you. We put it back up. These companies themselves will say, we don't always get it right. Um, on the conservative side, we talk a lot about how there's a disproportionate impact on conservatives when views are censored online. Some of the companies will say, yeah, that happens. We're working on it. Some of the companies will say, we got it wrong in all these cases. We're sorry. In other cases, they'll say, um, we know this happens. We think, it, we think it happens just as much on the left. And we get it wrong about the same, regardless or left or right. OK, that's another perspective. Um, what do you think? I think when you get it wrong and you fix it three or four days later, the moment's been missed. Conversations move quickly. The news cycle has accelerated. And so when somebody wants to weigh in on a policy debate and Twitter or Facebook or somebody incorrectly, by their own standards, takes down their post, only to put it back up three or four days later, the moment's been missed. The damage is done. It's not that it's repaired once it's put back on. Um, and I think the president is concerned about this for all Americans, regardless of their political views. We, um, we built a tool a couple of months back where people could share stories about how they've been impacted um, by whatever you want to call it, censorship, tech bias, by online speech issues. Um, and the original kind of introductory text of the tool was conservatives are feeling this experience, it's happening, whatever. Um, the president line edited it to say all Americans, regardless of their political views. And so I keep going back to there's no single person or entity or organization or group of entities or organizations I trust to get it right. And just quickly on that question earlier, do you have conversations with the president about what he writes on Twitter? We don't talk about the Twitter account. Ever? Here. I'm not going to talk about the Twitter account and how it's managed and All get right. into that issue. So, Teddy, um, we're going to take questions from the audience in, in 30 seconds, but what about, um, you know, this, this idea that um, neither side, that, that we really don't have a path, a clear path forward for these social media platforms to, to, to figure out what their healthy role is in our democracy? I, I think that, you know, nine times out of ten when people talk, not just on this, you know, on any issue, and they, they, they um, you know, they say they fear the unintended consequences of making a change, that's because they're, they, they're fine with the status quo. That's what that means. And, um, you know, I, I think conservatives um, have, have very successfully argued that um, the tech companies are biased against them, even though, look at Facebook's most um, shared post every single day. Eight, nine, or all ten of them are going to be Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire and places like that. Um, uh, so, you know, there's no evidence to support, um, you know, to support that claim. Uh, you said 30 seconds, I'm going to go a little over, sorry. But, you know, I, I was in the Philippines a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a horrifying situation. Uh, the, uh, most people um, have a cell phone, they may not have a TV, they may not have a desktop. Um, most of the carriers have deals with Facebook where Facebook is free and the rest of the internet is not. So if you log in to the internet, that's Facebook. You can read the headline, you can't even click off of it because that's going to incur a data charge. So Facebook is the intermediary for, for an entire country of 100 million people entire ability to access the news. And there's a very weak mainstream media there. There's essentially two mainstream media outlets, one of which is very likely about to lose its license thanks to the Duterte government. So misinformation is all you can find there. How is this going to work? And so we're worried about America as well we should be. We should also worry about the rest of the world. I think Ori is completely right that there aren't obvious solutions, that no one should have all the power, that there need to be appeals process, transparency, um, you know, lots of stakeholder engagement and so forth. Um, but the answer can't be let's do nothing for fear of unintended consequences because the consequences we've got now are intended and pretty rotten. We have time for two or three questions, one back here and one over here. Yes, sir. Hi there. Uh, Simon Galperin from the Community Info Co-op. This is a question for Ori and the Knight Foundation. Given the Trump administration's role in dis and, dis and misinformation and rhetoric that has led to the death of journalists from Maryland to Turkey, well, what are we supposed to think about you being here, telling us about how we should be interacting with our communities and ways that protect democracy and uphold our values? And to the Knight Foundation, what are we supposed to think uh, about this conversation in juxta juxtaposed to the conversation we were just having before about how important diversity, equity, inclusion is 
We used words like love. We talked about Reiki. And now we have an administration up on this stage that is actively working against everybody in this room. So I'd like to ask Ori why you think you should be here and the Knight Foundation why they think Ori should be here and deserves to speak to us. Well, I would say before Ori answers, I will say Ori was invited to provide a view from the White House where he could speak freely on what he could talk about and that that was not going to include, regardless of who was in power, speaking about certain topics. And so I don't, I'm going to let Ori answer that question in his own way. I'm certainly not speaking for him, but I will state on behalf, I think, of the Knight Media Forum and certainly myself who extended the invitation, that I welcomed the fact that he was willing to come to what some might have considered was hostile territory. So I am absolutely aligned with your commentary. I understand where it comes from, but not everything can be answered when you represent any political party. So I'm going to ask Ori to answer what he can answer, and I thank you very much for the question. So I was going to go back to something you said a couple of minutes ago when you were talking about the Philippines. Um, there is a danger to only seeing one side of an issue, to only seeing one perspective. Um, and to only being willing to listen to one perspective, and in that particular example, to only having one source of information. Um, the reason I have confidence in our country and in our democracy um, and in the American people to find the truth is because there's a multitude of sources of information. Um, there are a lot of examples abroad where um, really tragic violent incidents have happened because of um, disinformation in WhatsApp groups, for example closed networks where other information isn't able to get in there. Um, and so I'm always happy to have conversations with folks who disagree with me. Um, I have a lot of liberal friends, and I think you know, we all have different perspectives. If we're not able to talk about those perspectives, we're going to get more and more into our silos, um, have a harder time understanding people who disagree with us, and that's not good for the country. Thank you. We have a question over here. Yes. Uh, thank you. And thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Rick Timms, and I teach at Queen's University of Charlotte. And as I'm hearing you talk today about um, who can regulate uh, the web and how or should it be done, I'm thinking back to the earliest days of radio. And the earliest days of radio weren't regulated uh, until it became necessary, and it actually was uh, precipitated by the sinking of the Titanic, where uh, the uh, radio operator couldn't get back to, to shore. And so government intervened at that time and said, there's, there's a reason here for us to do something. Uh, the same thing happened with television. This, of course, is a different era, and it's a different time. But I'm curious to know what parallels you think there could be for where we are now and how, and why is it not appropriate for there be, to become some kind of a balance between the owners of the medium and, uh, and government to, to regulate. Daddy, why don't you start? Um, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, I was just talking to a sort of a media historian who said that with both radio and television, it took about 30 years, roughly, from the advent of the technology to the sort of settling down of the um, both business and regulatory framework that became, you know, sort of the commonplace for both of those media. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that th there's some magic to the to the idea of 30 years. You know, maybe with the internet, it takes 40 years or 100 years. You know, the, but I but I do think that, um, you know, we are at an early stage of figuring out how this is all going to work. Um, these technologies. Technologies. They don't feel that new. We've been living with them for a long time, but they're relatively new, you know. Um, um, and I do think there's a parallel. I mean, you know, uh, people talk about censorship and so forth, and I think, you know, part of that has to do with the fact that people perceive, um, and rightly so, or, or justifiably so anyway, you know, Facebook to be a platform rather than a publisher, and that's a very obviously open debate that I'm sure many in this room have thoughts on. You know, um, uh, you know when it comes to TV, um, you know, no one is um, guaranteed the right to a half-hour daily news show on NBC. 
and no one seems to think that's an injustice. So there are gatekeepers there deciding what kinds of content you have access to and what kinds of content you don't have access to. When it comes to Facebook, people think that is an injustice. And I get why. These are participatory platforms. You're, you know, checking in with your grandkids and you're, you know, you're talking to your friends and you're posting photos from your birthday party there. Um, I do think that, um, you know, the word censorship is a bit of a boogeyman. The idea of gatekeeping who's got access to mass media um, is um, something that we've all accepted and I think justifiably so. I think um, some um, ideas um, have no business getting a platform. Um, and so, um, you know, that's actually, th that history with radio and TV is part of why I am so enthusiastically in support of, of you know, um, a more aggressive regulatory framework when it comes to social media. Please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you so much, Judy, Teddy, Ori. Thank you.